So here's the MT case five. We're moving away from our trauma focus to um, other general medical types of calls. Same list of prereqs. You need to be able to find where you're going and plan that route and uh, communicate on the way, drive safely and promptly, um, get in the house, do an assessment, an assessment that's focused on the major things of circulation, ventilation, oxygenation, and then gather some data and info in an appropriate way, having a conversation while you get some vitals, uh, use elements of sample OPQRST, but don't go right down the list. Um, and then what do you do if this guy has cardiac arrest? How do we manage cardiac arrest? And then there's also an element of consent and refusal with this case to, to bring up. Um, standard terminology in the first line there, tachy, brady, and hypertension. Then we have this concept of myocardial oxygen supply and demand, as well as what is an MI, what is angina, what does the patient mean when they're talking about they had a calf or an angiogram, angioplasty stents, bypasses, and then ROSC. What is that term and where does that fit in? That should all be uh, part of this case. As far as the call goes, it doesn't matter what time of day or day of the year this is. You have a short response time and your ALS unit is 10 minutes behind and you are a non-transporting BLS first response unit again. The local system, uh, this is located fairly far away from uh, the hospitals and so we wanted to introduce that little wrinkle into things and you can expect that while if maybe you had a five minute transport time then the paramedics would set up and do some treatment at the scene but if you've got a 25 minute transport time uh, the most medics will appropriately move to the ambulance and begin transport. Your dispatch info is a Charlie response for chest pain in an address in the Sturgeon area. Sturgeon is a smaller community in North Boone County, quite a ways away from the Columbia hospitals. Um, also um, has an, an option to go further north into Randolph County up to Moberly to a small community hospital up there. Anyway, cross streets are Walker and Robinson. As you can see, you're coming out of station six in downtown Sturgeon. You have a fairly short, easy um, response. On that way, on the way during that short response, you're thinking, okay, chest pain. What could be causing chest pain? Well, there are cardiac causes. That could be a big deal. There's some non-cardiac causes that would not be that big a deal. Uh, in any case, we're going to look for and manage this patient's hypoxia and shock. And we're going to be concerned that this might turn into a cardiac arrest. I'm thinking about safety issues in every case. This one doesn't sound like there's lots of safety concerns other than the usual body substances. As I pull up to the house, I've got a fairly standard single family house with a nice little circle drive. That's always helpful for turning around ambulances. It's a fairly short drive, so I want to be cognizant of where I'm going to park in my first response vehicle. Um, and so there's a couple of judgment calls we made there, but you're just off the blacktop and the blacktop is a short distance off highway 63. So it's going to be a fairly easy and fast transport, pretty smooth roads. And that enters into the medics plan as well, where they're, they're going to say, well, we have a fairly long drive and it's a good smooth drive. So we can do IVs on the way. We can do lots of things on the way, um, down the, down the road to the hospital. You walk up to the house, patient's wife meets you and says, he doesn't want to go, he's mad, he's having pain, and I'm worried about him. And so now you have a, this um, internal conflict in the family, which is fairly common, in that uh, he doesn't want to go and she wants him to go. Here he is, it's Mr. Smith. He's sitting there having him a smoke, and um, he's got a radial pulse that's a little slow, his skin's a little moist, um, Breathing is, is okay, no cyanosis, so really, um, other than a kind of slightly slow pulse, it's the skin condition that stands out. Sweaty is not normal, um, and particularly not in this case. So before you know anything else, uh, you suspect that this guy could be critical. You don't have any evidence to prove that other than his, um, you know, just his, his complaint but um, you're, you're already thinking this could be cardiac. So given the location, that's going to be a pretty immediate transport. And we want to work on bringing this guy's oxygen supply up to meet 
his myocardial oxygen demand. So he is at rest, and yet he is having symptoms that indicate that his heart's not getting enough oxygen. So this is the big concern for us. And we're going to send some help with the ambulance because if he codes, they're going to need help. We're going to gather some data and info. We're going to measure those vitals. And we come up with a pulse ox of 94. So now we have to do some critical thinking there in terms of what we're going to do with his oxygen therapy. So he doesn't have any known lung disease. He's sitting there smoking, but that doesn't mean that he has uh, real COPD. So the COPD rules don't apply. Now, it is true that since he was actively smoking a cigarette, his carbon monoxide levels in his blood are somewhat elevated, which can skew his pulse ox to read higher than his actual oxygen saturation might be. Not a lot higher, just a point or two higher. So we get a pulse ox that says 94 on room air. And so that's not in the range of where this patient would need a non-rebreather for sure. But a cannula would make some sense, particularly um, if, if we think that he has something significant going on uh, cardiac wise. So it's totally reasonable for you to use two or three liters on a cannula for two or three minutes and reassess and see what that got you. So you say, what's been going on? He says, well, I was fine when I woke up and been about two or three hours. I've really just been sitting around having my coffee, reading the paper. Well, where's your pain? Well, it, it's not really a pain. It's just kind of pressure. And it, it's right here under my sternum. And so is it going anywhere? Or is it staying right there? And he says, well, in the last hour or so, it started in the left arm and left jaw. So, sir, how would you rate your pain? Zero is no pain. Ten's the worst pain you can imagine. He says, oh, it's about a four. And so that does not indicate how serious this is. If he had said zero, he could still be having a potentially lethal cardiac event. And if he had said 12 out of 10, that also doesn't indicate that he's certain to die. It just gives us a baseline to work with. And so you say, you seem like you're, you're kind of sweating. He said, yeah, I got really sweaty about an hour ago. And, uh, and now I think I'm, I'm, got, I'm a little bit nauseated. Those are also indicators that this is a significant event going on. This would get the attention of a cardiologist if they were standing in his kitchen talking to him. So what about uh, medicines? Do you take any meds? He says, yeah, I take Cialis. Well, what do you take that for? He says, my prostrate. And so what he meant is his prostate um, and when you ask a little further, he says, yeah, I've got BPH. And you may not know what BPH is. You may not even know what Cialis is. So you're kind of operating again with some incomplete information. And it's good for you to, to practice being in that situation. As the conversation goes on, you find out that he's retired now. Uh, had an office job that he retired from finally a couple years ago. He's somewhat active. Uh, let's say he, you know, he mows his own yard, but on a riding mower, that kind of thing. Um, he doesn't look like he's grossly obese or horribly out of shape, but he's also, you know, sitting there having a smoke while he's uh, having chest pain. So um, doesn't really see his doctor very often. Doesn't know if he has high blood pressure. Doesn't think he has diabetes or lung disease. Uh, if you if you ask him, he's smoked a little bit for a number of years. Um, and again, he's talking about his prostate. So then you're going to gather some more info um, as you go through a, uh, an exam on him. And you say, so <clears throat> let me push on your chest. Does that hurt? No. So take a deep breath. Does that hurt? No. So you can now report um, that his pain is not pleuritic and not reproducible. Um, you listen to his lung sounds and they're clear in the upper fields. And he's got a few little wheezes in the bases. Who knows, is that asthma, is that COPD, is that pneumonia, is that just because he smokes, what is that? Um, no, no idea for sure. Um, so you say, you have a fever or chills? No. Uh, do you have a cough? Yeah. Is it changed at all? Are you, are you coughing more? Are you coughing anything up? He says, no. So you're gathering this info um, as part of a conversation that is based on looking for uh, differential diagnosis, looking for what's causing this chest pain, and you're kind of working down sample and OPQRST, but not exactly in the order that they're listed, and that's totally fine. 
So you're thinking, what's going on here? I need to make a plan, do, do some action on that plan, keep rechecking. And so we think he's having some cardiac event going on. Potentially, he's having a myocardial infarction, a heart attack, which can turn into cardiac arrest, but we can't prove it. And so we've got a couple of sets of vitals here, and they're not really changing very much. And it looks like his O2 sat came up a little bit after four or five minutes. So I think we'll stick with that O2 therapy. And then, you know, we really want you to go to the hospital. And he says, I don't want to go. And so can he refuse um, treatment and transport? Absolutely. Why? Well, because he has the legal capacity. He's old enough to make his own decisions. He has the mental capacity. He's fully oriented. He understands and can explain back to you why you want him to go to the hospital. Because you think he's having a heart attack and it could be treated there. And the benefit of going would be he gets it treated. And the risk of not going was that it doesn't get treated and it could end up killing him. So he understands all those things. And then you say, well, so if, if we don't transport you, if we leave now, you know you can call us right back and we'll come back. There's, you know, it's fine. We understand. Nobody wants to go to the hospital. But if you change your mind, call us back. So if he has legal capacity, mental capacity, he understands and can explain back to you the risk and benefits of what you're offering. And he knows how to change his mind. If those four things are in place, you can have a legal refusal. Just because you think he's making a dumb decision doesn't mean that it's a bad uh, bad thing and you have to force transport on him. He has the ability to make his own bad decision at this point. So the ambulance shows up. You say, hey, this is Mr. Joe Smith. He's 67. He was okay, but now he's having substernal pressure, nausea, radiating the left arm, skin's cool and clammy. You've just painted a picture for any paramedic anywhere that is very clearly cardiac pain. You go on, he's got no history of heart issues or hypertension or diabetes. He does take Cialis. And even though you may not know why that's important, it's very important to the paramedics. Cialis would be a contraindication to them using nitroglycerin, which would be one of the main treatments they would offer this man pretty soon. <clears throat> here's his current vitals. Then here's the inbound report um, that the medics would give or that you would give either way. It's pretty much the same report. The only thing the paramedics would add to it is that we see this on EKG. We see this on capnography. Um, we have an IV. We've done these medicines, but it's the same core report. However, during transport, things go suddenly bad, and we were planning on this to happen anyway. This is not a shock to you. It doesn't happen very often, but when it does, we should be prepared. He slumps, he stops breathing, he has no carotid, he starts CPR, and you attach the AED and do what it says. When you have an AED, you must use the AED as soon as you can use the AED. CPR is not appropriate now. You do not prolong this patient's ability to be defibrillated by doing CPR. The only reason you would do CPR is if you didn't have an AED. If you've got an AED, you got to use the AED. It says uh, shocks advised. You deliver the shock. You place a, a superglottic airway, king or eye gel or whatever you've got, and the AED will prompt you every two minutes. This is your standard code, and this is you know how we work things. Here's the handoff to the ER. Um, and how that would look uh, on a patient who has arrested during transport. Self-debrief. Again, what went good? What would you change? Did you do anything wrong? What are other kinds of chest pain that you could work on? What if the guy didn't have any chest pain? How would you have detected that he had a myocardial infarction going on? Here's the written report that you would write. You can pause the video and, and check that out. Here's the written report that the ambulance uh, did, and they added in some ALS things in there. If you, if you want to uh, look at that, you can pause. And it's a longer report, so it took um, two pages. 
Your video debrief, same stuff as usual. Questions you might ask. Talking about routing to the scene. Talking about um, the patient refusal and what is required for that. And could maybe you convince the patient to go as opposed to say, eh, no, I understand. You don't... You, Okay, if you don't want to go, you don't want to go. Uh, but you think in this case, you really need to advocate for this guy. Then your destination decision, the small community hospital to the north that may or may not have full cardiac uh, capability in terms of cath lab and such. And um, then we, we also talked about uh, in the very first slide when we arrived at the scene, I talked about that short driveway. And so... Think about where you're going to park, where your helpers are going to park. You're going to back in some of those kind of little things. Um, this guy's a smoker. Does this impact your assessment? Um, we talked about that earlier in terms of that probably raises his pulse ox a point or two. Um, but then it also may be an indicator of lung disease. And we talked about how the radiating pain with nausea and cool, pale, and clammy really should increase your um concern about this. Um, his, his heart rate was slightly irregular. What do you do with that at the BLS level? Uh, and the answer is just note it and pass it on, but it doesn't necessarily mean one thing or the other. Uh, it could be benign or it could be an indication of extra uh, ventricular beats that are indicative of an irritated ventricle that's irritated enough that it might want to go into V-fib. We talked about, uh, well, we didn't. We mentioned BPH. We didn't really talk about what it was. So figure out what it is. It's benign prostatic hyperplasia. Cialis treats that. It's also used to treat erectile dysfunction. And then uh, what about the wheezes and this and that? And why did he code? Was that your fault? And then what other things can you um, transfer this case to? Why did the medics do what they did? Um, there's lots and lots of, of questions that can come in that can enhance your learning and your ability to operate uh, in the next, um, on your next call and in future cases. So that's case five.